you don't have that many scriptures today, and most will be in the uh, book of Genesis, which is the easiest book to find. But in the meantime, we're going to look at Romans 15, 29. And here, and you can read with me where, you can read silently with me, where Paul says this, and he's talking to the church in Rome. He had never been to that church before, and he writes this long epistle to them. And among the things he says towards the end of the epistle, because I think there's only one more chapter left in, in Romans 16, he says to them, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, in our examination of the scripture, we define, uh, we define each major component, part. We define fullness, blessing, and gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to review this this morning. In its simplest meaning, fullness simply means full. <laughs> means complete, as in nothing lacking, nothing missing. And using fullness in other scriptures, and we see Paul using that in other scriptures where he talks about the fullness of God and the fullness of Christ, he draws this fullness word from a Greek term which means to complete the task of filling up to the full. To complete the task of filling up to the full. In other words, just think of a glass that's partly filled. You pour water in it or whatever you're drinking. Could be gin. <laughs> whatever you're drinking, you fill it up to the full. Well, that's the definition of fullness that Paul takes when he's describing fullness in other parts of the scripture. The complete, to complete the task of filling up to the full. So to me, that's a task given to the believer, to release the fullness of the blessing in our life to the full. Now, as the next major component word in the scripture, blessing, in other words, the fullness of the blessing, blessing is the next term that we examine. Blessing is a spiritual term meaning empowerment to succeed and to prosper. Now for the believer, and that's us, this success and prospering relates to whatever we set our hands to. Now, in life, our hands may be set to a number of things, as I said last week, including the job that we do, raising a family, teaching in a classroom, teaching a Sunday service, writing a book, starting a new business, or pursuing the sacred life of consecration to the Lord. But it has to do with what we set our hands to. So that means that we have to set our hands to something. There are a lot of people, uh, in fact, I can remember speaking to people in times past when they said, when they were having a challenge, well, you know, I'm just sitting here waiting for the Lord. I know he's gonna make a way and I know something will turn up. No, if you want something to turn up, you got to turn on some heat yourself. You remember the scripture in, in, in the gospel, in the uh, book of James, where it says, draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. God is motion sensitive. He will move when we move. Amen. So, set your hands to. Now, the third component of the scripture is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, he talks about coming in the, to the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we know that Gospel refers to the good news, and it's the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God, and it refers to the death of Jesus on the cross, and of course his resurrection, and all of this would restore the blessing to mankind and restore our relationship to God. Remember, because of Adam's disobedience, the blessing that he enjoyed had been turned into a curse for himself and for the entire world. Jesus came to restore that blessing and also restore our right relationship with God. When Adam sinned, he cut off our, his spiritual relationship to God. You remember the scripture says that, uh, that God says if you, if you eat of the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden that you shall surely die. And we know that Adam actually lived to be 960 years old. So he physically didn't die. The death was his spiritual death. He was spiritually cut off from God. Remember in the garden, he communed with God and they were in tune spiritually. That spiritual 
life that he had with the father was cut off and that's and that's and it's cut off from us unless we are born again so that's why becoming born again is so important so the gospel refers to having all that restored now it's about the good news of grace and peace of salvation redemption and eternal life ushered in by god through christ jesus now today we're going to examine the blessing in greater detail and explain more specifically what it is for us what it is for us and what it means for us and what it tells us and we'll cover as much of this as we can this morning again let's recall that the blessing is something that god pronounces on us or really upon us when we are born again the blessing is the crowning glory of our salvation and newness of life ordained by God and delivered by Jesus and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's start with what the blessing is for us and why it's so important for us. The blessing is an all-encompassing... Now, these next words are words that I wrote, so... The, when I say I wrote, I, I mean I'm not... These are not taken from the Bible. These are not taken from apostle or from, from anybody. This is what the Holy Spirit gave me. The blessing is an all-encompassing benediction. Benediction is blessing. God pronounces on his children as they embark on a new life. Amen. It is pronounced on us believers when we are born again and we begin our new life in Christ Jesus. The blessing is God's stamp on the born-again believer, that's us, that says you are complete. You are complete and fully empowered with everything that you need, and I underscore everything that you need to prosper and succeed in, again, whatever you set your hands to. Now, if you don't ever set your hands to anything, <laughs> then actually that will prosper too. In other words, your nothing will prosper. You'll have more of nothing. But the blessing is more than God simply empowering us to succeed or prosper. The blessing represents God's personal stamp that endows us with what I call the radiance of transcendence. The radiance of transcendence. Now the radiance of transcendence is important because it goes beyond equipping us with human might and human means to succeed. Now let's look at the terms radiance and transcendence to get a better understanding of what I mean by this. Radiance is a word, and you can imagine because you, you, you've heard the word before, it means filled with light, shining brightly and sending out rays of light. When God pronounces a blessing upon us, we are filled with his light. And that light can radiate outwardly and shine brightly in and through us. Yes. In what we do. I have one amen here. <laughs> Remember these words from, uh, and you can go there. It's uh, little John at the back just before uh, Revelation. It's one John. 1 5. It's little John. It's right next to Revelation at the end of the Bible. I want you to take a look at that so you'll remember what it is or where it is, I mean. In 1 John 1 5, the scriptures say this This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In other words, we can radiate his light because remember. From Genesis 1, 26, we are made in God's image and likeness. And we always refer to the fact that God is a spirit, so we're made in his spiritual image and likeness. But God also is light, so we're made in the image of light, just like God. So that light can radiate from us and through us because the blessing transfers that light to us through Christ Jesus. So the blessing is something that comes upon us and can radiate outward from us as God's light. That's why we're called the light of the world. We are the light of the world. Now, transcendence comes from transcendent, which means to go beyond the limit. In other words, transcend the limits, to exceed, to be separate from or beyond experience of the material universe that is beyond human experience. So when the blessing, uh, with the blessing upon us, we are able to do things that exceed what would be viewed as normal human capability. 
This is partly what we see reflected in the declaration in Ephesians 3.20. Go to Ephesians 3.20. It's a scripture that you know. Ephesians 3.20. Here at Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to him, to him is God, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. By this transcendent power of the blessing that operates in and through us, we are able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can humanly think or ask. The radiance of transcendence of the blessing enables us to pass beyond human capability and endeavor and reflect or shine through with a response that is beyond human comprehension or capacity and sometimes people call this a miracle and while it may appear as a miracle it's really not a miracle it is God's special endowment or empowerment that he pr pronounces upon us with the blessing when we're born again and the process operates as a normal part of everyday life and capability so when you get that promotion that you've been seeking, it's not a miracle. Right. When you get that raise, it's not a miracle. Right. When you get that new house, it's not a miracle. Amen. It's the normal operation of a blessing operating in your life Amen. because you are releasing the blessing through your life and bringing these things to pass on your life. I like to think of the blessing as being like a bank account that you draw from as you need. So forth. Now, if you have a million dollars in the bank and you never go there, then you will not get the benefit of the money that you have. It's like the lady I described, I think, last week, who died, she actually froze to death. And when they went in, this was during the winter, uh, a couple of years ago, and when they went into her house and they were removing things, they were removing the mattress from her bed and they discovered that her mattress had $500,000 in it. But it did her no good because she didn't draw from it, so forth. So if you don't draw from the blessing by releasing it, Amen. you will not get the benefit of it. Now, in our study of the word, we see that pronouncing a blessing on his children as they begin life or begin a new life is God's method of operating. And I went over this uh, before, but I'm going to go over it in a little more detail this morning. Uh, we see him doing this with Adam and Eve at the dawn of their life their created life, which was also at the dawn of creation. So in Genesis 126, 128, you can go there. We're going to be in Genesis for a while, so you can turn to Genesis. And uh, we see the pattern that God established for the blessing. Genesis 126, and I'm going to read it. You can follow along. He says, then God said, let us, and the us is referring to the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over all, and I'm skipping something there. I'm just going to go dominion over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And the very first thing he does, and you see this in, in verse 28, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, you are empowered to succeed Amen. in what I've assigned you to do. And of course, he assigned Adam to, to taking care of the garden, working in the garden, and so forth and so on. So you see that the first thing that God did after the creation birth of Adam and Eve was to bless them and command them to be fruitful and multiply and exercise dominion over the whole earth. Now, in blessing Adam, God empowers Adam with all the things necessary for him to prosper and succeed in managing the earth. And you can be sure at this point that Adam walked and lived in the fullness of the blessing. We saw the same process of blessing in the life of Noah. At the end of the flood, when Noah was ready to embark on a new life ordained by God, that's after everything had been destroyed, new world, new life, we see in Genesis 1-9, you're right there in, in chapter 1, look at verse 9. No, there must be something wrong with that. That's not 1-9, is it? No, 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 no. Let me take a quick look. Can't be 
it's uh, it's Genesis nine. Uh, it's uh, and it's not nine one. Well, it, it did, it's nine one says, and so God blessed Noah. He 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 does bless Noah at this point, and of course he blesses them again when they're leaving uh, the ark. So it's Genesis nine one. Uh, I have it backwards. One nine. It's nine one. So whenever you see, if I pass out something and it, it, and it doesn't look right, change it around and you'll get you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> it has all the elements there. You have to figure it out. <laughs> so it's Genesis nine one. God blesses Noah. <laughs> So God blesses Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He says this when they depart from, from the ark. Now with the blessing, God equipped Noah with the fullness of everything that he needed also to prosper and succeed in his new life on the earth. And we see this pattern of blessing continuing as he blesses Abraham. Now the blessing is pronounced upon Abraham when God commands him to embark on a new life. This new life. See, Abraham, you can't say Abraham was born at this point because he's 75 years old when God gives him this new assignment. But this is a new life for him. So turn to where you're in Genesis. It's, it's, go to Genesis 12. And we're going to read verses 1 and 3. In verse 1, now the Lord had said to Abram, he was then called Abram. His name was changed to Abraham by God later. Get out of your country from your family from your father's house to a land I will show you. Two, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you a great name and you shall be a blessing. Three, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we, again, we know that Abraham was able to walk in the fullness of the blessing. God pronounced the complete and fullness of the blessing upon Abraham when he commanded him to leave his country and start a new life in the new land that God would show him. Now we already discussed the blessing of Abraham when we started this uh, series, so we won't go over that again. But I just want to remind you that the blessing that we derive from Abraham is a material blessing. So we see the pattern of blessing uh, that God does began with Adam, and we see it in Noah, and we see it in Abraham as they began life, or actually started a new life. It's the same process God follows with us. When we are born again and become a new creation in Christ Jesus, we are embarking on a new life. So to make sure that we are fully equipped with everything that we need and it's deposited within us, God pronounces a blessing upon us. And that blessing contains everything we need. So when you hear me or other teachers or pastors tell you that you already have it, it's already in you, it was deposited in you at the time we were born again. And the blessing encompasses all of this. So you already have it. And what you have to do is release it. And you release it through your faith. You release it in what you do and so forth. We'll talk more about that later. But you already have it. So when somebody tells you that you have to go here to get it, or you have to listen to me to get it, or you have to get it through me and whatnot and so on, don't believe it. You already have it. That's right. Amen. You already have it. If you go to a church where the pastor says that your blessings flow through me, that you have to bless me in order to get your blessings, you should run. <laughs> because you're being misled. You're being, you're being shortcut. Because if, in fact, your blessings are coming through the pastor, then your blessings are limited. You've been given unlimited blessing. So you already have it. Very important to know that. Now, so uh, with his blessing on us, God empowers us with everything we need to prosper and succeed in our new life. When we're born again, he endows us with the radiance of transcendence, which gives us supernatural appearing power to respond to challenges and opportunities that come our way in life. It's the power of the Spirit working within us that he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could think or ask. Ephesians 3.20, which we just cited. At this point, we are complete in the fullness of the blessing. Now, another important point to remember is that it is from God's blessing that he pronounces upon us when we are born again that all the individual blessings flow that are needed to meet particular challenges and circumstances. Overall, is a blessing. But when you are ill, you need a blessing for healing. healing. 
when you need financial assistance, you need a blessing for that. It's the overall blessing, but it's the individual blessings that are flowing from uh, the blessing. And uh, to give you an example of this, uh, you're in uh, Genesis, go to Genesis 24 and look at verse 1. And if it's not 24-1, look at 1-24. No, it's 24-1. <laughs> We're told in Genesis 24, 1, now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in how many things? Oh. All things. That's everything. The blessing response to the individual blessings needed for the all things in our life. We saw in last week's discussion how individual blessings flow from the blessing when we looked at the, book, the blessings and the curse in the book of Deuteronomy. You remember we went over the blessings in Deuteronomy 28? In Deuteronomy 28, we're not going to review those again today, but Deuteronomy 28 says this, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice, which means the word of the Lord your God. And what followed 28.2 uh, was a list of the blessings that would come upon us and overtake us if we obey the word of God. Now, another important point to bear in mind is that when I'm referring to the blessing as pronounced upon us when we are born again, I'm referring to God's blessing that includes both material and spiritual blessings. And again, as I just said, we know that it's from our connection to Abraham that we get our material blessings from God. And it is from our connection with Christ Jesus through salvation that we derive our spiritual blessings. We see this covered in the scripture in 2 Peter, verse one, uh, verse, uh, 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 3. You can turn to that. 2 Peter, we're going to look at two, just one thing there. 2 Peter 1, 1 3. You got it? 2 Peter 1, 3. You got it? Yes. Which says, and his, his being God, and God's divine power has given us has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. That's why I'm saying you already have it. Remember, this is past and has given Amen. to us all things that pertain to life. That's the material things we need in life that include your food, your shelter, your clothing, and so forth and so on. And godliness. Godliness is the spiritual part of your life. And so, and so to double down on the fact that you got both, uh, look at Ephesians 1 verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. I'm going to pass, make this available to you in, in, in print form after I make these corrections. <laughs> and it's a good thing I didn't pass this out this morning. It has, two, it has a couple of mistakes. And, uh, you can always find something that, that's not correct. You know, when you, I, I, there are books that are published by really, really smart people and somebody didn't find their mistakes. I don't think I've ever read a book that I didn't find a mistake in. It's true. I'm covering myself. <laughs> Ephesians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we have both. Later, in a, in, a, in a future message on this topic, I'm going to show you how the spiritual blessings actually translate into material blessings, how the two are reconciled. Because people say, he's blessed us with all uh, spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but we're down on earth, so what good does it do? But I'm going to show you how the two are reconciled, but we won't do that today. Now, now the all things that pertain to life and God, oh, we've already done this. Uh, now, as I said previously, just as it was with Adam, Noah, and Abraham, when God pronounces the blessing upon us, when we're born again, we are endowed with the fullness of the blessing. <coughs> All things has been given. We're already delivered from the power of darkness, translated Amen. into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light, and so forth. Uh, Jesus has... Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Escalations. Uh, 
where he has redeemed us through the curse of the law by dying for us on the cross so that the blessings of Abraham might come along. So all of this is done. That's why you already have it. So you don't have to go anywhere looking for it. I mean, you don't even have to come here looking for it. You know it. But if you come here, we're going to remind you that you have it uh, and that you already have it and you just have to release it by your faith, by your belief, by what you do, by your obedience to the word and so on. And we'll talk more about that later. Amen. Now, after making this big statement about the fact that we're endowed with the fullness of the blessing when we're born again, the question is asked, and someone actually asked me this question, why don't we always operate in this fullness? If it's already been given to us, why don't we always operate? And that's a good question. It's a good question because when we look around at the lives of believers that we know, you know, believers even in our family, not everybody is operating forget about the fullness of the blessing, they don't seem to be operating hardly much of the blessing at all. Right. So why is this true? So in thinking about this question, I asked the Holy Spirit to help me come up with uh, an answer and a practical illustration that would address the issue. So what came to mind was an experience I had in college with uh, my professor of political science. On the first day of class, the professor stood up in front of all of us and said, Today, everyone in this class has an A. That's right. See, he knows. <laughs> Day one, we all have an A. And I said, good, I'm leaving. Right now, I'll take my A with me. So did we all end with an A at the end of the semester? No. And there was a wide variation in the grades, ranging from F to A. A lot of C's, a few D's, a lot of B's and a few A's, but this is the deal. In announcing that we all had an A on day one, the professor pointed out that it would be up to each one of us in terms of what we did to maintain that A. What we did would include our classwork, several small exams during the class, uh, our classroom participation, our midterm exam, and then a final exam if we performed at the top in all of these things, we could maintain an A. We start with an A, and we can maintain that A, or we could, so some people applied themselves, some people worked hard, some people studied, others just slacked off, and so forth. And so their grade was according to their faith, according to their, their work, according to their work. So giving everyone an A on day one, by this college professor is similar to what God does on day one of our new life when we're born again. On that day, God commands, in fact, on that very instant, he commands the fullness of a blessing on each one of us. He says, you have an A in life. Amen. But whether we live and operate in the fullness of a blessing at all times in our life depends on our performance, just like in class. So, so the variety of ways in which we perform that affect the level or grade of the blessing we live in include a number of factors highlighted by the following. And I list at the top of the, the, the list of choices we make. It involves our study and knowledge of the word. It, enjoys our, it in, involves our obedience to the word, nope. our faith, our belief versus unbelief. Nope. It involves whether or not we let fear crop into our which will cut off the blessings. Unforgiveness will cut off the blessings. Amen. If you hate your mother or father or your brother or your neighbor, you can forget about the blessing flowing fully in your life. Unforgiveness, I would say, is the number one. Unforgiveness is, no, well, there, there's so many number ones, but it's right at the top of being number one <laughs> blessing blocker. Unbelief is a blessing blocker. Fear is a blessing blocker. Not knowing. The word of God is a blessing blocker. Not obeying the word of God is a blessing blocker and so forth. But everything involves the choices we make. Now getting back to the class, I can remember uh, in school, they were, I went to school where a lot of rich kids were there. So a lot of them didn't think they had to do anything. So they, they, when they, after that first day, a lot of them didn't even come back to class. That was a choice they made. If you're not in class, you don't know 
the subject matter that's, that's going to be covered in the exam, the midterm exam and so forth and so on. So that was the choice he made. So the choices we make are really important. And I have a little phrase, which is really true. It's catchy. Our lives are shaped by the choices we make. And it's so true. Right down the line. You can make a whole message on that. Now we're going to examine some of these factors and see how each of our examples of Adam, Noah, and Abraham measured up and how their responses affected their enjoyment of the fullness of the blessing. A lot of this has to do with the choices they, they make and their disobeying God. Now, we're going to look at the choices they made and see the impact, as well as obedience in some cases. In the beginning, Adam enjoyed, as we said, the fullness of the blessing, having been created in the image and likeness of God, who blessed him immediately after his creation. In Genesis 1.28, he blessed them. Shortly thereafter, unfortunately, Adam made the choice to listen to the serpent, to listen to his wife, who listened to the serpent. And this, I started to make a joke there, but it's not too funny, because I'm not going to make it, because I look around, there are more women here than men, so I might not get out of here alive. <laughs> Be careful, you are snared by the words in your mouth. <laughs> That's in Proverbs. <laughs> snared means trapped. So thus, not only did Adam lose the blessing when he disobeyed God and, and, and made that horrible choice, he turned the blessing into a curse for him and the entire world. And we continue to see the effects of Adam's choice and disobedience in the sin, sickness, poverty, and death that's evident in the world today. Now, Adam continued to live a life spiritually cut off, as I was talking about earlier, from God. And obviously did not end up with an A in life. And we see the curse operating then and now. And we see it operating in the earth then and now and on Adam's life. Because you remember what happened. What did Cain, his son, do to his other son, Abel? He killed him. He killed him. But Adam did live to, I said 960, but I, this is correct here, 930 years. And, you know, give or take 30. 900. He lived this full life spiritually cut off from God. But we do get from him, in his genealogy, we get the person of Noah. So let's turn to Noah. And I'm going over this for a reason. What I'm going to show you is that even though people start out with the full blessing, their actions cut into how they experience the fullness of the blessing. Same thing for us. Now, when Noah was born, his father Lamech said in Genesis 5.29, see if that's correct. Somebody go there and see if that's correct. He says, this one will comfort us, meaning Noah, will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. The whole earth was cursed, remember, literally. Now we know the story of Noah and the ark, the flood and so forth, the flood that wiped out the whole earth and so on. And we see how God blessed Noah when Noah embarks on a new life at the end of the flood. But really, Noah ended up disobeying God and this obedience had far reaching consequences for mankind then and we continue to see it today. Now this is something you rarely hear here taught, but I'm going to give you the scriptures that, 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 that point it out. To understand Noah's disobedience, we have to go back to God's instruction to Noah regarding how he and his wife and his sons and their wives should enter the ark and how they should leave the ark. You're in Genesis? Yes. You're going to be in Genesis the rest of the yes. time, I think, so uh, look at Genesis 6.18. Genesis 6.18. God says to Noah, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your son's wife. That's the order. We notice here, as God instructed, is the order that people were to enter the ark. The men boarded first, and the women last. God's very specific about this order, and he repeats it again in Genesis 7, 13. You don't have to go there. Now, Noah obeys God's word and goes into the ark exactly as he said. This is the order of things that the earth had settled on after the days of Adam and Eve when they walked together side by side. See, in the garden they walked side by side. Eve did not walk behind Adam. 
Now, at the end of the flood, God, God gives Noah another command and instruction on how the people should leave the ark. Look at Genesis 8, 15, 16. Genesis 8, chapter. You, you could miss this if you don't really. In other words, you could get swallowed up in the flood and not see this, 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 this porn here. So in Genesis 8:15, 16, it's recorded. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. This last instruction from God to Noah is also very clear. Noah was to leave the ark two by two, male and female together. He and his wife, his sons and their wives together, all leaving in that, in, in that in sequence together. This was God's plan to go back to men and women being side by side and equal as he had established in the Garden of Eden. You rarely hear this, 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 this talked about. But here's where Noah disobeys God. Look, you're in Genesis 8. Look at verse 18. It says, so Noah, it, listen carefully or read carefully. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wife with him. He did exactly the way he went in. He disobeyed God. In spite of the blessing on his life and in spite of God's specific instructions, Noah would not change the way things had come to be done where men and women were separate and unequal and women walking behind men. This disobedience by Noah has had a profound effect on the new world he embarked on, on after the flood. And we see effects of this persisting to this day. Wow. Noah's disobedience is an example of what the Bible refers to as our rejecting the word of God to follow the tradition of man now when we follow the traditions of man instead of obeying God's word we interrupt the flow of the blessing in our life which may also impact the world community at the same time in some parts of the world women still live and walk as second class citizens and you know this is very true in the Middle East parts of Africa and so forth and so on and partly in, in maybe some individual households too I don't know <laughs> And recently, I, I really marvel at this. We saw women finally receiving the right to drive an automobile in Saudi Arabia. And this was held like this was such a great women's liberation thing. They finally can drive a car and so forth. We also see in our society that women are still viewed by some men as mere objects of desire to be mistreated, abused, used at will, and disrespected. To see how this permeates today, to see this disdainful attitude toward women in action, we need only mention some names that are currently in the news, like Bill Cosby, Roger Ailes, Bill O'Reilly, Harvey Weinstein, and sadly to say, President Donald Trump, in terms, in terms of disdainful treatment and attitude towards women. It exists today. In part, we can trace this treatment of women back to Noah's failure to obey God when God intended to set us on the right path, side by side, and equals, and so forth. I took the time to do this because I don't know, I've never heard this talk. But you see it right here for the word yourself. So, so the point is, is that when you disobey God or when you make your own choice, it can not only affect you and your family, but it can have an impact on the community and the community at large, meaning the world community. Now, again, our disobedience of God's word not only short circuits of blessing and create disastrous consequences for us individually, but the behavior can impact the larger human community, as we just saw with Adam and Noah's disobedience. Now, when we turn to Abraham, who's the father of us all, we find that even he, this is our great patriarch, he got out of, the, out of the flow of God's blessing at times when he disobeyed God. Right after God tells Abraham to leave his country and his family and to be blessed, Abraham commits his first act of disobedience. He takes his nephew Lot with him. God had said, leave your family. He takes Lot with him. And guess what? He got into a lot of trouble, so to speak. Uh, first of all, his household and Lot's out household were coming to blows. They couldn't get along. They had to separate. Later you see where Lot and all of his 
kinsmen and tribe and everything and all their goods were taken and they were taken in captivity and and uh, Abraham has to go and rescue them in that process lies were lost and so on. he recovered everything he did not obey God in, the, in that instance uh, and another example of disobedience we see Abraham leaving the land of Canaan where God said he should dwell and in going into Egypt now Abraham thought he had a pretty good reason this is all in, in, in Genesis you can follow right there along. he was in Canaan God said go there now if he had complete and total faith in God he would know that if God gives you the vision he also gives you provision he's going to support you but when the famine came he panicked and his faith dimmed a little bit and he went to Egypt to get food again disobeyed God right here he gets into more trouble you remember he passes off Sarah his wife because she was beautiful <laughs> as his sister so some of the princes in Pharaoh's house said you know that this beautiful woman you should bring him into her into your house which he did and Pharaoh was interested in Sarah and then he finds out that Abraham had lied and this was really his sister but look what happened to Pharaoh Genesis 12 17 it says right here I'm not making it everything that I'm saying is in, in, in scripture Genesis 12 17 says are you there but the Lord plagues Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah Abraham's wife but Abraham put her in that position so he not only caused harm and discomfort to Sarah but he caused harm and discomfort to Pharaoh's house yeah. needlessly so and you remember you, you read the scripture I'm not going into all this because we don't have time Pharaoh says man take your wife and get out of here yeah. and so forth and so on now no doubt the choice that Abraham made that had the most serious consequences for really to me all of mankind and consequences today is when he gave into this is a choice he made he gave into his wife Sarah's urging that he marry Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian maid, to have a child. He does this. The child born is Ishmael. Ishmael was really the first son of Abraham. Or Ishmael, if you want to pronounce it right. Ishmael. After Ishmael, uh, Ishmael, I should really pronounce it the way, is born, God reinstates his covenant with Abraham that he had pretty much given to him before. Abraham, who's now 100 years old, Sarah is 90, and he says, next year, the two of you are going to have a child. <laughs> and this is in, this, I have one person here who knows Bible. <laughs> if you want to follow along with this, this not, not right now, but later, that's all in the 17th chapter of Genesis. Now, upon hearing that God, hearing from God about the child that he and his wife Sarah would have, Abraham pleads to God on behalf of Ishmael, his firstborn. And we find this dialogue between Abraham and God in Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, 18 to 21. We're going to go over that. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. 19, God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an ever everlasting covenant and with his descendants after you. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him seedingly. He shall beget 12, begot, begot 12 princes. And this happens. This is in the Bible. You'll see this. And I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. So we pick up the story again in, in, in chapter 21. Uh, let's go to Genesis 21, 9, 14. Genesis 21, chapter 9, I mean verses 9 through 14. At, at verse 9, now this is after everything has settled down and the little son is growing up. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she had born to Abraham scoffing in other words he was laughing at her at least she thought he was making fun of Sarah 10 therefore she said to Abraham cast out this bond woman bond woman is a slave woman and her son for the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son namely with Isaac 11 and the matter was very displeasing to Abraham sight because of his son his son Ishmael 12 but God, but God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad, Ishmael, or because of your 
bond woman, Hagar, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. 13, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondswoman in Israel, because he is your seed. 14, so Abraham rose, verse 14, so Abraham rose early in the morning. Do you mind if I take a few more minutes and just finish a couple of So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, Hagar's shoulder, the mother, and gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. But this was not the end of Ishmael, as we all very well know. And you can follow the story if you want. It's continued uh, <coughs> in the Bible. But God, God does come to the rescue of Ishmael in the wilderness. And you remember God said in Genesis 21, 13, that he would make a great nation of the son of the bondsman Ishmael. So Ishmael goes on to become part of a great nation. And you know who that great nation is. He is an ancestor of the prophet Muhammad. And a great nation of people became the Islamic nation. Islam has made war with their first cousins, who are the Jews, the descendants of Isaac and Abraham, since biblical days, and continue to make war with, these are first cousins, remember. Remember, the descendants of Ishmael are first cousins to the Jews. And so, and they have made war since the beginning yes. of the Bible, and they continue to make war today. And there's no sign of peace today in 2017. All of these troubles in Abraham's family and the enmity between Muslims and Jews emanated from the seed sown in Abraham's failure to strictly obey and follow God's word that resulted in the birth of Ishmael. Bitterness developed between Abraham's house and Ishmael and his mother Hagar when they are banished from Abraham's house. This mistreatment of these two Egyptians, Ishmael and his mother Hagar, set the stage for the animosity between Jew and Muslim that is evident to this day. Wow. So you're right. Wow, you're right. <laughs> so we see in the lives of Adam, Noah, and Abraham that the fullness of the blessing on the life of the individual can be blocked, hampered, or otherwise derailed when there's a failure to obey God's word and when bad choices are made. Now, we saw that at the start of, of the new life, or life, God pronounces the fullness of the blessing on each, Adam, Noah, and Abraham. Just as he did in their case, Adam, Noah, and Abraham, God pronounces the fullness of the blessing upon each of us when we are born again. But it is up to us to continually, to continually release the fullness of the blessing through our faith. And we must have faith in the fullness of the blessing. You must believe that it's true. And we must also make the right choices and we must obey the word of God. Now, as we have already shown God is pretty clear about what he thinks we should do. Remember in Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, verse 2, God says this, All of these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord your God. Now, wouldn't you like to be overtaken by blessings? Yes. When you obey God's word, you are positioned to be overtaken by his blessing. But again, you have to know God's word, and that's why you study. That's why you come to Bible study Tuesday and Thursday. That's why you come on Sunday, and that's why you study and on. And that's why you ask questions if you don't understand some, so that you can know and do God's word. Second, God is very clear about what choice we should make with respect to the blessing versus the curse. Deuteronomy 30, 19. 30, 19. God says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing and he says therefore choose life he doesn't even say think about it or guess he says choose life let's choose life and blessings reject death and cursing and so, so again as I said earlier everything flows from blessing and, uh, and, and, and one of Elenae's favorite scriptures come to mind uh, in terms of wealth Proverbs 10.22 says what, Elder Nate? You hear what he said? The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow with it. So the blessing is so important. Now, returning to our early illustration, and I'm just about to close, just as there are things we have to do to maintain that A in class, there are things that we have to do to maintain 
the fullness of the blessing in and on our life. At the top of the list are the choices we make and our obedience to God's word. The two things that we looked at in the lives of Adam, Noah, and Abraham. But there are other commands in the word of God that we do not always observe and are the things that prevent us from living in the fullness of the things of God. And let's remember these words of Paul in Ephesians uh, 3.19. Paul urges us, 3.19, Paul urges us here to seek to know the love of Christ which passes all understanding that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And he talks about being filled with the fullness of Christ also uh, later. But let me just point this out, and I wanted to, 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 to not leave without you understanding this, because we've said it before in the, in the ministry, and you've heard it from Apostle Price. While the love of God is unconditional, God loves us unconditionally. God's promises are all based on condition. God's promises are not unconditional. What that means is that they are conditioned on you doing something. One of the first things is obeying his word and so forth. Now, the subject of conditional promises is a lesson in and of itself. But let me just take you back to Deuteron Deuteronomy 28, which says that these blessings will all come upon you and overtake you if you obey the word. It says the commandments or the voice. Commandments and voice both mean the word of God and so forth and so on. Now, remember, the blessing comes upon us when we are born again. And we are born again because we have obeyed the call to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We've, uh, you're in a service somewhere or someone is ministering to you and you obey that call to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. You're obeying that call. It's very important. Now, let me list some of the major things in Scripture that we should observe. And, and I'll come back to these uh, later. What you already know in order to maintain the fullness of the blessing. We have to be careful with our choices. Our lives are shaped by the choices we make. Be diligent in our study of the word to gain the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. We must have faith in the word uh, that we gain knowledge of. And we must be obedient to the word that we learn. We must not allow unbelief to cripple our belief in faith. We must not give away to fear. See what happened to Abraham when he was in Canaan and went to Egypt. Fear overtook him. What he was saying is that we're going to starve to death. He forgot that God was his provider and so on. And he went into Egypt and got into trouble. So you must not give away to fear and we must not harbor unforgiveness. Now with that, I'm going to close today. We'll come back to this and we'll go over some of this uh, next time. But I just wanted you to get, I wanted you to hear the story of Adam, Noah, and Abraham because the aspect that I brought out today, you don't always hear, maybe you've never heard and so forth. But it's to show you that your choices, your obedience or disobedience and so forth can have incredible far-reaching consequences to you, your family, your community, and the world community. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight.
we would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.